uh, happy to be here and to share with you what uh, uh, I actually personally I've been working on for the last 13 years of my life. Um, first as a grad student at Caltech and now as a um, co-founder of Solisium Energy. Um, so there is a, I have a demo which I'll show at the end. There, there is a computer in here. Um, so, you know, it's not too far of a, of a stretch. Um, we are an energy harvesting um, company. And so I'm going to talk to you about uh, thermoelectrics, um, specifically materials that convert heat to electricity. Um, and as Andy said, uh, these are enabling low power electronic devices um, of the future, whether it's a wearable or Internet of Things device. Um, and so I'm going to walk you through the story of the last 13 years of my life. Um, uh, you know, I'll try to make it exciting. Um, we'll start off with, uh, you know, how, how this, how I got started. And, and again, I was a grad student um, in the lab working in the field of thermoelectrics. Uh, we'll talk about, you know, how, how it was that this turned into a startup um, and how we've sort of managed to get our, to get out of the, what, what's called the valley of death right here in the valley for most startups and into uh, viability, what we believe is now a viable business. Um, let me uh, start off by saying something very obvious that energy is important and I'm not going to bore you with, you know, we've all seen like the sun, uh, you know, sends enough photons in, in one hour that we can, that we can use it for, for an entire year if we needed to. I mean, we've seen all these statistics. Um, I just want to make the point that everything that's living is basically a transducer of energy. Um, you know, it takes an input it of some form transduces it into something else and gives you an output. Um, so this gentleman, I don't know what, I'm not really sure what he's pointing at, but um, my two-year-old son, uh, his inputs are, you know, peanut butter and fish um, and a lot of nose from his mom and dad and his outputs are kind of, I'll do whatever I want. Um, you know, every, every living thing is a transducer of energy um, and uh, the point is every thing that living things create are also part of this paradigm. Um, I mean, since we are just transducers, we interact with our world with inputs and outputs. Um, I'm going to go uh, a little, one slide here, a uh, little off track. This is, I think, just one of the most amazing organs of the body, the human ear. Um, and you know, we'll just—I'll just walk you really quickly how, how this transduces acoustic energy um, to an audio signal in your brain. Uh, you have the outer ear; the audio, you know, the acoustic waves hit the tympanic membrane, which is the eardrum, and then there are these amazing three small bones in your ear, and they basically act as like a little hammer. The eardrum. Uh, bangs on one of the bones, the malleus, and that transmits the energy to the stapes, which is kind of like a hammer that hits a liquid-filled part of the ear called the cochlea. And what's so amazing about this is if you were to just, to tr um, if you didn't have those bones and you just tried transmitting acoustic signals directly to the liquid-filled cochlea, you'd have an amazing impedance, impedance mismatch and a huge loss of, of energy. And so evolution has developed this un incredible, you know, exquisite um, transformation, impedance matching with these three tiny bones. And then what's, what's even more phenomenal is in the cochlea you have these hair cells. And as the liquid moves, the hair cells generate, uh, the, the hair cells move in, as, as a response to the different frequencies uh, from the acoustic signal. Those hair cells give off neurotransmitters that stimulate the auditory nerve, and that sends an action potential to your brain. And then beyond that, we don't even know what happens, right? I mean, the brain does its own signal processing. It's, it's just, it's unbelievable. I mean, right? I mean, it, you, you look at this and it's like, wow. Um, this is just one sensor of among five, right? Taste, smell, touch, um, sight. Common man-made transducers. Um, these are the ones that are sort of, you know, the most common to transduce some sort of input into useful electrical energy that we use today. AC, naturally producing AC generators, uh, AC generating uh, devices are steam turbines, right? Developed a long time ago. Piezoelectrics, the DC ones, as we know, batteries, solar cells, thermoelectrics. 
Um, it's interesting, there's, I'm, I'm gonna be talking about thermoelectrics, obviously, for the majority of this talk, but if you look at all these, one of the outliers is, is the battery. The battery is a self-contained device that needs to be recharged. It, it, it eventually uh, ends up going, you know, dead, de de depletes. Whereas every other device, as long as I'm providing motion to my piezo, it's gonna work. As long as I provide steam to my turbine, it's, it's, you know, it's always gonna be moving. Solar, as long as there's light, it's gonna, it's, gonna, it's gonna turn on. And as long as there's heat for the thermoelectric, it's gonna generate power. But the battery eventually will, will die. And so the, the reason is that, as, as, as you all know, is, is it's simple, right? It's simple chemistry, right? It's filled with a bunch of chemicals. Lithium cobalt oxide is the most common. Lithium gets depleted, and the only way to recharge the battery is to use an outlet. So we've got wires sticking everywhere, you know, uh, for our phones, our laptops. It's, it's really annoying. So what if there's a way to eliminate the fact that you have to charge everything with an outlet? And the answer is there is. Of course, it depends on the application and how much power you need, but the human body is, a, is at, at rest is about 100 watts. This is an incandescent light bulb. This is actually from the Livermore Fire Station. This is the oldest running incandescent light bulb in the world. This is more than 100 years in operation, believe it or not, without actually having ever been replaced. Um, we're about 100 watts, like a light bulb. And when we're exercising, we're a kilowatt. So there's a lot of heat that the body gives off that we're wasting. And we can use some of that heat with a thermoelectric, that's the idea, to basically charge, to, to, to recharge a battery so that you never have to plug in your, you know, let's say wearable device into a, into a wall outlet. So what, is the, what exactly is a thermoelectric? A, a thermoelectric is just a transducer that takes heat input and generates electricity. So you've got a temperature differential from some heat source that creates a voltage. And it works in reverse. If I supply electrical power to the thermoelectric, I can make one side cold and I can use that for refrigeration. And the way it's assembled, um, this is kind of like a cutaway, um, it's got N and P semiconductor elements that are connected electrically in series. And if you notice, they're all thermally in parallel. So one side is hot, for example, and one side is cold. So they're, th they're, th they're thing, you know, th uh, uh, heat flux, uh, all of these blue PNN semiconductor elements are seeing a heat flux um, longitudinally. And they're all electrically connected in series so that you can maximize the amount of voltage that you get out. Each one provides a certain voltage for a certain temperature drop. Thermoelectrics have enabled a lot of things. Maybe some of you guys drive cars that have car seats that cool. Um, some of these are in some of the luxury cars. They're, they're actually getting a lot more popular. Um, this is an image taken by Voyager 1 uh, from about, I think, 4 billion miles away from Earth. That little tiny, tiny dot, you can see it's right, right there, is the Earth. And um, yeah, it makes Donald Trump look small. <laughs> um, this was, uh, Carl Sagan had the, the NASA team rotate it around to take this picture to kind of put everything in perspective. Voyager is basically powered by a, thermo, a radioisotope uh, nuclear powered uh, thermoelectric generator. So a piece of plutonium inside the, the, the spacecraft heats up um, a thermoelectric, and I think in this case it's based on silicon germanium. Um, and this thing's been operational since, gosh, when was Voyager launched? It was, uh, so many thanks, thank you. And it's, I think, just recently confirmed that it was, you know, the first man-made object that vacated the solar system, which is pretty remarkable. Um, but again, this, is, this picture is possible due to thermoelectrics. Uh, Mars, uh, Cur the Curiosity rover on Mars is uh, thermoelectric powered. It's almost, I've seen it at JPL before they launched it um, in 2012. Uh, it basically was as big as a car almost, it's huge. And you can't put enough, uh, you know, solar panels, solar panels would be too prohibitive, they'd, be, they'd have to be enormous because this thing is really power hungry. So they used a thermoelectric and it's still, you know, it's been there four years and it's still going. A thermoelectric, in essence, is really just a heat engine. Um, you know, it's, it's a thermodynamic heat engine. It's, uh, there's a hot reservoir on the hot side and a cold reservoir on the cold side. And it does work. It takes some heat in. Some part of that work, part of that heat gets, um, 
uh, turned into work, and some of the then heat is expelled through the cold reservoir. And um, you know, in a steam turbine, the working fluid is steam. Here, it's just electrons. I mean, that's really the only difference. And since this is kind of you know a CS EE crowd, um, uh, let's just look at the circuit diagram, and, and you know, we can derive a few useful equations. So if I take a thermoelectric material that has a temperature gradient, the thermoelectric material itself has its own internal resistance, <coughs> and I attach it to a load, the voltage that's generated is equal to S times delta T. Delta T is, being the, is, is of course, the temperature difference. S is the Seebeck coefficient, which is just the ratio of the voltage to the temperature drop. The larger that number is, the larger the voltage. Um, the efficiency of this device is the work output, W, divided by the heat that's needed to create the temperature difference, Q. The work extracted, of course, is at the resistive load, which is the current times the uh, voltage across the load. Um, of course, this is a simple uh, resi you know, series uh, resistive uh, divider circuit. Um, two, two resistors, one, one being the load, one being the thermoelectric. And you can work through all these equations. I guess I won't bore you too much, but the work is just proportional to S squared, the Seebeck coefficient squared. The heat input is interesting. It consists of three terms. Uh, one is just the natural flow of heat across the temperature drop due to the thermal conductivity of the material. The Peltier, there's a Peltier term, I, S, T hot, and a joule heating term that actually has a negative sign in front of it because it actually counteracts the other two, so it fights against them. And if you rearrange a few things um, and maximize for the efficiency, you get this complicated looking equation, but if you remember from thermodynamics, ZT is, as, and we'll talk about that in the next slide, is this dimensionless figure of merit if this is equal to infinity, this entire term here goes to one. And if you remember from thermodynamics, uh, the efficiency of a Carnot engine is just delta T over T hot. That's the maximum efficiency that you can get. So the name of the game in thermoelectrics is to maximize ZT. There is no theoretical reason why it can't be infinity. Um, you'd like it to be as large as possible so you can get the largest efficiency from the conversion of heat to electricity. And it's, it consists of three material parameters. And these are the three material parameters that makes this field of thermoelectrics so challenging to, to, to work in. Because they're not mutually um, uh, independent. And so S, as I mentioned, is a Seebeck coefficient, otherwise known as the thermal power. It's the ratio of the voltage out divided by the temperature in. The larger that number is, obviously, the, the better, right? If I could get like 1,000 volts for a one degree temperature drop, that would be fantastic. Uh, typically, they're on the hundreds of microvolt per Kelvin uh, on that order. The sigma is the electrical conductivity. I need a material that is super, super conductive because I don't want joule heating losses. If you remember that third term, it's a joule heating term. I, I want to minimize the loss there. And kappa is the thermal conductivity. I need that to be very low, and that's why it's in the de denominator because I need to maintain a temperature differential. So if you look at these three terms, in a metal, a metal, as you all know, is a very good conductor of electrons, but it's also a very good conductor of heat. Uh, it's really, really hard to decouple these terms from each other. So if I increase sigma, I typically increase kappa. If I increase S, I typically decrease sigma for other reasons that we won't go into. It's incredibly hard um, to uh, you know, untangle these terms. And this number has kind of hovered at room temperature. Um, it's kind of hovered at 0 0.8. And we'll get to the, that, that material is called bismuth telluride. We'll get to it in a few slides. But that's kind of the maximum uh, ZT that's kind of at room temperature that, that you, can, you can buy commercially. So how does heat um, give you an electrical output? Well, it just moves electrons from hot to cold. And the way it does that is you can think of the electrons uh, classically as a gas, right? So as you all know, when you heat a gas, the gas particles tend to diffuse away from the heat source and the gas expands, right? They, they have a lot of, uh, they absorb a lot of thermal energy, they have a lot of, their velocity increases and so they diffuse away. And that's exactly what happens. Um, a heat source basically creates a voltage differential because the electrons go from hot to cold. Um, you know, classically speaking, it's very, very simple, right? And that Seebeck coefficient that I mentioned, again, is just delta V divided by delta T. So how do you maximize the Seebeck coefficient? 
Well, let's take a look, <coughs> excuse me, at a metal. Um, if you remember from physics, a metal uh, consists of a lot of electrons that are free to move around, but they're only free to move around at the Fermi surface. Um, and so when you excite an electron in a metal uh, through the uh, in introduction of heat, that's that little red sliver there on this metal Fermi surface, each electron has about kT of energy. Thermal energy is like kT, right? That's Boltzmann's constant times the temperature. Um, turns out that the Seebeck coefficient, if you, if you just you know, uh, look at your thermodynamic properties, is just the entropy per electron charge. The entropy is the heat, Q, divided by the temperature, divided by the electron charge, that's the, the Seebeck coefficient. And so the heat, as I said, is kT. So you plug in kT for Q, the T's cancel and you get K over E. But in a metal, only the electrons at the Fermi surface are allowed to, to move. All the other metals below the work function are kind of trapped in the valence bonds of the, of the metal atoms. And so you have to normalize that by kT over EF. And so if you, this is again, a, a kind of a zeroth order approximation. If you run the numbers, right, K is just a, is a constant. T is, I plugged in room temperature. Um, EF, you know, use a typical work function for a metal, let's say 5 EV or whatever. That's roughly a microvolt per Kelvin. Tiny, tiny voltage for a one degree temperature differential. Microvolt is not gonna do, <laughs> is not gonna do you a lot of good. So are there other <coughs> materials that we can look at that'll give us larger Seebeck coefficients. Because remember, we need a large Seebeck coefficient. Well, it turns out for a semiconductor, it's different than a metal. A uh, semiconductor can be doped, and if it, let's say it's doped n-type and you've got a lot of uh, some electrons in the conduction band, well, its Fermi surface is a lot smaller, but all the electrons can move around because it's, they're all in the conduction band, they're doped that way. And so there is no normalization term, and you just, you know, each, each electron contributes kT of energy, and at room temperature, that translates into about 100 microvolt per Kelvin. So it's better. It's about two orders of magnitude better than a metal. Um, it's, again, not a whole lot, right? It's not, it's not uh, volts, like, like a, let's say a lithium-ion battery, right, is, you know, 3.7 volts. But it's still better than a metal. So most um, thermoelectrics, as you'll see, are based on, uh, most commercial thermoelectrics are based on semiconductors for this, for this particular reason and others. Um, let's look at the thermal conductivity. You want a low thermal conductivity. Well, how do you do that? Um, if you guys remember from you know, Hooke's Law, if you have a mass on a spring, and just imagine a crystalline lattice. The atoms are all sort of connected by bonds, and you can model the bonds as a spring. Um, there's a spring constant K, and each uh, atom has a mass, M. Uh, the velocity, the speed of sound in that solid is just the square root of K over M. Again, just from Hooke's Law. Um, again, to zeroth order, right? This is an approximation, but I think it works well. Um, in, a, in a material like bismuth, an alloy of bismuth telluride, well, bismuth telluride turns out um, is one of the world's best thermoelectrics and uh, alloys of it at room temperature. And the reason for that is bismuth is a really, really heavy metal. In fact, it's the heaviest, uh, excuse me, it's a, it's a, uh, a semi-metal. It's the heaviest element on the periodic table uh, before, you know, bef the elements after it are all radioactive. So it's the last heavy metal that's non-radioactive. And um, when you put, when you create an alloy of bismuth and tellurium together, um, you, you've got the heavy mass from the bismuth, but you also have the fact that you have different mass densities across your material. And if you think about a vibrating string, right? Let's say I had a string up here and I just created a standing wave on it. And that's my, you know, my 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 waveform, uh, the the you know acoustic uh, motion. If I tie another string to it that has a different mass density, and I do the same thing, the wave will propagate really nicely in the first part of the string until it hits the knot, where it sees a different mass density on a different string. Some of that energy will be reflected back, and that's kind of like analogous to thermal conductivity being lowered because some of the heat flow is basically bounces back. And so that's why alloys of bismuth, uh, bismuth and tellurium are really good. Turns out diamond, which is a crystalline form of carbon, has the highest thermal conductivity. And the reason for that is, first of all, carbon atoms are very, have very strong covalent bonds, meaning K, the, the, the spring constant is very stiff, right? Those bonds are really, really strong. 
And it's got a carbon, as you know, has a very, very low or light mass. And so its thermal conductivity is very high. You don't want to use carbon for a thermoelectric. Um, the other thing that you want is obviously high electrical conductivity. And turns out semiconductors are great because you can dope them. You can actually grow. This is a silicon ingot being grown, right, in a Tchaikovsky process. Uh, you can, you basically put silicon in, into a container and you put a bunch of dopant atoms, right? If you want an n-type, you put phosphorus or arsenic. If you want a p-type, you put boron or aluminum. You heat it up and you create a big boule or ingot of the stuff and you withdraw it. And now you've controlled, you can control the electronic properties as, as you all know, incredibly well, right? I mean, that's what makes the computer uh, possible, right? So semiconductors are the materials that are in use for thermoelectrics for these reasons. And bismuth telluride is the incumbent material because um, it can be made to have good high electrical conductivity and it also has uh, a very low thermal conductivity. The problem with it though is that it's brittle and very expensive. Um, it's brittle when you try to cut it or manipulate it in any way, it just flakes off. Um, and it's very expensive because uh, bismuth and tellurium are not, uh, you know, uh, very uh, common elements found in the Earth's crust. Tellurium is rarer than platinum. So um, when I was a grad student, I had spent uh, probably two years um, at Caltech working on a material uh, that was very exotic, and I wanted to make it into a, a very good thermoelectric. And uh, you know, I wrote a nice little paper about it. It was a, it was a really long slog those two years, and um, I realized after that, and this might be some advice to, to, to grad students, right? Is is you got to really work on things that are relevant um, if you want to um, make a difference, right? I mean, if you want to be an academic, that's fine. I mean, you know, you can publish papers and and do do that thing. That's that's totally fine. But if you want to uh, do something relevant, you have to work on materials that scale that are economically you know, relevant. And so I started looking at silicon and I looked at the literature and there had been some promising results um, with silicon uh, from a few years uh, before, before I got started in this field. Um, silicon turns out has a very high Seebeck coefficient. So it's about five, for an optimally doped uh, doping concentration, it's about 500 microvolt per Kelvin, which is actually pretty high for a semiconductor. Um, it has excellent electrical properties, right? It can be doped, you know, very, very highly, which is, which is great. The problem with it, the one problem with that is it has a very high thermal conductivity. So it conducts heat like a metal, you know, it conducts heat as, as good as aluminum, basically. Um, so I started looking at some papers, there had been some efforts uh, before my time where people had made silicon nanowires and measured the thermal conductivity, and it turned out that it dropped. And so I wanted to pursue this, um, uh, this research and lower silicon's thermal conductivity. Well, it turns out silicon has this amazingly, I mean, sort of lucky um, property in the sense that it has two different length scales for its heat and for its electrons. The heat uh, is mainly transported by phonons, which are just atomic vibrations. It turns out in silicon at room temperature, phonons travel every 300 nanometers before scattering, uh, but the electrons travel 10 nanometers before scattering. And so there's a huge discrepancy in length scales, 300 nanometers for the heat, 10 nanometers for the electrons. And if you can create defects that are on a length scale somewhere in between, you can force the phonons to scatter off those defects uh, at a higher rate and lower the thermal conductivity. Whereas the electrons, because they're scattering every 10 nanometers at a very short distance, they're basically blind to those defects. And so, Here's um, you know, a little cartoon, the, these little blue dots inside our bulk silicon material here are defects. The electron is this green particle that just kind of whizzes right through because it just doesn't see them. It's scattering every 10 nanometers anyway. The phonons, which normally would whiz right through as well because they have a much larger scattering uh, distance, actually are end, up, end up being forced to scatter into them. And so the heat slows down tremendously. Um, the analogy, and this is a great analogy that my co-founder came up with, um, the heat, the phonons are like vans, right? And the defects are traffic cones. And the heat is just basically bumping into these traffic cones, whereas <laughs> the electrons are your little scooter motorbikes that just whiz right through. They don't even see the, the traffic cones at all. And so what we did at Caltech when I was a grad student is we made uh, this really intricate structure, um, kind of almost like a MEMS-looking device. Um, this green 
array here, you can't really see the individual nano, nanowires in this false SEM image, but that green rectangular region is a bunch of nanowires uh, side by side, uh, 20 nanometers in width. Um, and all these electrodes next to it are just basically uh, used to interrogate the temperature, the voltage, and all that for, so that I can measure ZT. Uh, that snake looking pattern is just a heater, so I, you can apply current through it and it, through joule heating creates a temperature difference. So you get the point. You, you can make this really intricate structure, measure the silicon nanowire's thermoelectric properties, and it turns out at about 20 nanometers, the thermal conductivity drops like a rock. Um, and the defect in this case is the boundary of the wire. So the heat just basically um, sees the boundary because it's 20 nanometers. You know, it likes to go every 300 nanometers before bouncing off something, but here it's forced to bounce off the boundary because the, the width is only 20 nanometers. And uh, I, just to put things in perspective, bulk silicon has a thermal conductivity that's about 120 watt per meter Kelvin, very high. In a silicon nanowire at this length scale, it drops to nearly one watt per meter Kelvin, so almost a hundredfold decrease in the um, thermal properties. But remarkably, the electrical properties are unperturbed. You can still maintain high electrical fidelity through this structure. So looking at this, you can probably envision that this would never be a manufacturable process. Um, you know, let alone you know start start the launch of a of a startup to try to to try to make a real world device from something that looks like this, and so I went off um, after my PhD to the University of Michigan and in Ann Arbor, and I always, you know, I I, I wanted to take this discovery um, that we that we had there and figure out a way to scale this process, make it manufacturable, turn it into a company because I, I really thought this was you know uh, some there, there could be something here. So I had a group uh, at Michigan. Michigan is just a jewel of a school. It's it's not like your typical ivory tower. It's like Stanford. They're really they have a really uh, entrepreneurial spirit, and I had a lot of support from my colleagues. Um, we hit upon a process that we um, felt was scalable, and my co-founder at the time he was just graduating from Caltech as well. He came in uh, to Ann Arbor, lived in my basement, and we tried you know getting this process up off off the ground. Um, and that's where this part of the talk is, is how this Silicium got started and sort of the challenges that we've faced and how what we've over, overcome in the last sort of four years. So, so the first part was really, that was 2003 to 2000, you know, even up to Michigan where, we've, where we first hit upon our first scalable process, uh, 2011, so that was eight years of my life. Um, when we launched the company, uh, when my co-founder came into my basement and we started getting some good results, we were actually approached by uh, Vinod Kosla, Stanford alum, you guys I'm sure know who he is, um, just a visionary uh, guy. I mean, he, he's a high risk, high risk tolerant, uh, looks at, you know, he, he wants to do things that are really big, uh, really impactful, and, um, you know, he's just been a, just been a, a wonderful um, um, a person to us. He gave us our first seed funding to launch the company when we thought we, our, our process was solved and we could scale it up right away. Um, we set up shop at Michigan's um, incubator. This used to be an old Pfizer building. Pfizer vacated it and Michigan bought it. So if you guys are looking to, um, you know, to move on and, and, and you want to be, uh, you know, you, you want to have maybe your own group and you want to you wanna do something in uh, entrepreneurial, Michigan is a, is a fantastic place to do it. Uh, in fact, we even got funding from the university through their MINTS program, which I think predates anything that Stanford even uh, had going um, in terms of funding uh, startups, spin-offs from the university. So we set up shop there and we, um, you know, obviously with the, with the idea of, okay, we have this process that we think works, that's scalable. Um, how do we get it ready for prime time and, and make a business out of it? And it turns out, um, not only do you have to do that, obviously, when you're doing a startup, you have to figure out what market you want your technology to impact. Um, this this uh, thermoelectrics can do can do a lot of things, right? They can they can go into automotive. They can recover waste heat from your car exhaust and give you a boost in fuel efficiency. Um, they can um, scavenge uh, waste heat in a factory. Uh, and improve, you know, your your um, bottom line in a factory. They run in reverse, as I mentioned before. They can do refrigeration and cooling. Um, they can do wearables and IoT, provide energy for uh, rechargeable batteries. 
Um, turns out that the process, the initial process when we got started that we thought was scalable wasn't. Um, we, you know, we had this process, um, as we sort of kept turning the crank, we figured out this was just gonna be too cost prohibitive and we needed to pivot. And this is, I think, a common thread among you know, any, any startup, right? The growing pains that you experience. Um, and really what you're doing as a, as a startup is you're always basically looking to extend your runway, right? That's, that's, a, that's something you hear a lot. Um, your runway is basically how much uh, cash you have left in your, in your account. And if you don't extend it, you better be you know, ready to launch. And so um, you don't want, ever want to be in a spot where you're running out of cash and um, the technology is not ready. So after, um, oops, after a, another funding round, and, and the great thing about Vinod is that he told us to just do this. Um, you know, take your time, figure it out. Don't rush into a market uh, with a technology that's not ready, that's just foolish. Um, but you see this happen a lot with startups, right? Um, they go in, their, their investors want to push them to go fast and, and hard, and, and they end up um, going into the wrong market, right? So we developed, um, after a, a pivot, uh, another process. I, I have it here as a black box. I'm not going to go into the details because of its proprietary nature. Um, but we're basically today producing silicon devices um, that have been certified um, by two independent experts um, that are very high performance. We don't need a clean room to do this. We're not a, a solar process or a CMOS process where defects are, you know, uh, having just one defect could kill your transistor. In fact, defects in this case are our friends, as, as I showed you, right? You want defects to uh, basically impede the flow of heat. And we have, um, about an eight hour turnaround from wafer to actual completed module device. So, so that's great, we figured out a process and now we need to figure out, okay, what, what type of market do we want to attack? Um, it's obvious that no one likes to recharge a battery, right? Uh, that's a pain point. Um, I've got an Apple watch, I've got to charge this thing every day. Um, some of you I'm sure have some, some smart watches that you wear and you've basically got to charge the battery anywhere from a day to a few weeks to maybe a month. And the other thing is that the battery, if you look at a lot of these devices, whether it's an Apple Watch or it's um, a Fitbit or a Pebble or you know whatever it is, right? It's uh, almost always the battery is about half the volume. Um, and uh, that limits the amount of functionality that an engineer can put into uh, the device because you're space constrained because the battery's so large. So we are, after talking to a lot of customers, and this is something you have to do as, as a startup, right? You gotta figure out where the pain point is and what your customer wants solved. After talking to a lot of different customers in the space, we think this is a great market to go into. And we're actually taking advantage of a convergence of a few things. Um, the most important being that electronics are getting uh, uh, are using, are utilizing less and less power. So five years ago, this technology would not be possible, believe it or not. Uh, MCU power consumption was just too high. So TI back in 2004, you know, you're, you're looking at chips that are operating in the hundreds of microamps per uh, megahertz. Today, you can buy MCUs that are down in the, you know, 30 microamp per megahertz range. Uh, there are some newer chips that are even that are coming out that are even lower, which is quite remarkable. I mean, you're you're kind of actually getting close to the fundamental, you know, limits of uh, yeah, energy consumption. You know, you're just you're just gonna eventually hit a wall where you can't just like Moore's law, right? You can't you can't just uh, get free energy, right? It's it's quite remarkable, um, and because of this fact, we we can leverage. The comp these low power computing chips and uh, with our energy harvesting technology power a um, you know a pretty uh, impressive suite of functions in a smartwatch. Is th are thermoelectrics the best choice though, right? That's another question. I mean, at the end of the day, there's other energy harvesting technologies out there. Um, for example, there's piezoelectrics and photovoltaics, right? Two that come to mind. You, depending on the uh, the way you construct it, 
in the application, you can get anywhere from the low microwatt to even milliwatts of power generation. In a piezoelectric, um, if you put it in your shoe and you step, you can generate close to a milliwatt of power. In fact, there's um, somebody, I, I don't know if it was in Europe, I forget, but there was like a sidewalk that somebody, you know, so a sidewalk and they put a bunch of piezoelectrics and people are just like stepping, you know, they're just going about their day and they're producing power uh, to light, I don't know, the street lighting or something. I, 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 I'm not sure exactly what, but it, it you know, you can actually create a, a lot of power with piezos depending on the, the application. For a wearable, for Internet of Things, um, it's going to be difficult, right? Because for a wearable, if it just goes on my wrist, just doing this is not going to create a lot of power. It's going to create less than a microwatt of power. So piezoelectrics are out for smartwatches and your typical sort of Internet of Things sensors. Um, photovoltaics, photo, you know, photovoltaics are great. Uh, the main problem, though, is that you've got to be in direct sunlight to get appreciable power from a photovoltaic. If you're in a room like this and you're just barely at an, at an angle from, from you know, normal, uh, you're producing a, a microamp of, of, of current, which is just minuscule. The great thing about thermoelectrics is that, and, and we have this motto at the company, um, as long as you're alive, the thermoelectric will work. <laughs> um, you're giving off, as I, as I mentioned, you know, about 100 watts when you're at rest. When you're exercising, you're giving off a kilowatt. There's a lot of heat coming off your body. The efficiency is really, really tiny. Remember, these are heat engines. And for a heat engine to be very efficient, you want to operate it at high temperature. But of course, this is, you know, your, your skin temperature is not much uh, hotter than, than room temperature. Um, it doesn't matter, though. You can still generate milliwatts of power um, depending on what you're trying to do. And so, so for a smartwatch, that's fantastic. So I think thermoelectrics have a very uh, promising role to play for these types of devices. Um, I think, you know, there's never going to be one silver bullet. You're, you could probably leverage um, a couple of, uh, you could leverage thermoelectrics with PV, for example, or piezo. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. And in fact, it, it would make sense. So I'm going to get close to wrapping things up here with a little demo um, of, a, of a prototype that we've built at Cilicium. Um, you know, we, we think we've kind of done and gotten out of the really uh, hard part. Uh, I mean, there's still a ton of challenges and, 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 and things left to be done. I mean, we're, we're, we're still nowhere near the finish line. But um, in terms of figuring out the market, figuring out the technology, I think we've done a lot of the heavy lifting. And, and that's where you, know, you get to sort of where, you, where, where I think we're at viability. And so this is the last part of the talk. Um, this is a little simple prototype that basically operates off your body heat. Um, it turns on an LCD display that tells the time. Uh, we've got a MCU in here and you know, the whole works that, that turns us on. So, you can see that the screen is off, right? Right, just sort of the, for the people in the front here, the screen is off. Okay, so I'm gonna put this on and hopefully it'll work. <laughs> I was getting nervous on this part. So, I'm sorry? <laughs> oh, the, the, the time is correct because we have a rechargeable battery in here. <laughs> there it goes, it turns on. And I mean, it's the time is probably a little bit off. I, I don't know if, uh, yeah, it's, it's saying it's 2.30, so it's, it's off. Um, but it's machine. <laughs> so it turned on, and that was directly due to my body heat. Um, if I take it off, there's some latent heat, so it'll stay on for a little bit. But as soon as it turns off, I'll, I'll show you. So I'll just leave it here. Um, it's still on right now. Again, as I said, there's a little bit of latent heat. Um, but it's remarkable, right? Um, you can power a smartwatch just from your body heat without having to ever worry about recharging the battery for, for you know, some applications. Um, I think you, you, know, you made a good point, right? I mean, we've made demos without batteries in them to show uh, that you can, we've, we've actually made a demo where you light up an LED that's at two and a half milliwatts without a battery. Um, it's just got a capacitor. Um, you always want, uh, you know, we're always gonna want some sort of energy storage uh, because when you take this device off your body, you want to be able to retain memory, right? You don't want the user to have to redo the time, <laughs> for example. So, you know, 
I've really got to thank my team. I mean, especially my co-founder Douglas, who's been through, you know, has been with me for the last four years and and through through it all. I think we've got a really strong team that I'm really really proud of. Um, the watch is off, so yeah. So. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, we've got Haifan and Ann and Martin. Um, we've just hired our sixth person, a, PhD, a fellow who has got a PhD from MIT, who's joining February eighth. Um, you know, we've just been we've been doing this for some time until we really feel like we've got it to where to where I think we can uh, you know make an impact uh, in the marketplace and and at that. I thanks a lot. Thank you a lot for your attention, and um, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. A couple questions. So first, um, this, this example you had, um, it, from the sound of it, it was relying solely on thermal electric for power. Which um, sorry, which example? Uh, the example you just passed on. Oh, this um, prototype. Yeah, the product that's relying solely on the thermal electric for its power source, as well as, as well as for filling its storage, essentially. Correct. In other words, you wouldn't also plug it into charge it, for example, if you wanted to do that, so you would increase the longevity. Even... Correct, yeah, you would just, yeah, it's it's basically, it's being powered by the body. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I guess I asked that because when I've seen previous stuff about memory gathering for various IoT applications, they're often a hybrid structure. Are you also charging that kind of thing? Um, so when you can you just um, can you can you just specify what you mean by hybrid structure? Well, 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 you have something like a traditional plug-in to charge it, and then you use the energy gathering technology to enhance longevity. Okay. Um, I mean, I think it depends on the application. Um, ideally, you wouldn't want to have it wired. Um, I mean, if you if you if you could wire it, then why would you need energy harvesting? Um, and, and maybe I'm missing your your question. The point of your question. Just makes it last substantially longer, potentially. Even if it's wired, if it's wired, you mean, or? No, no, just to plug into charge. Right, right, right. Okay. To extend the battery life. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. I, I think I was confused by your question. Yeah, no, no, no. Absolutely. I mean, you, there are going to be some applications where, you know, for a low power device, you can you never have to recharge the battery. But for other applications, uh, for other devices that are power more power hungry, you can absolutely extend battery life, um, which is a pretty nice. Uh, is a, is already a nice thing. I mean, we've we've had a lot of people tell us um, that you know if you could extend the battery life of this one device just by thirty percent, that's already a big deal. Um, so, I'd, does that make sense? Yes. What's the variation between people or between weather? <laughs> yeah. Does that help? Or oh my God! Yeah, it, it helps tremendously. Yeah, that's a great question. So the inter the variation with people, where we're we're doing those studies actually. I mean. Um, we don't have enough statistics, so I can give you an answer, right? Between male, female, older, younger, um, but we hope to get to, to get those variations, you know, sometime this year. Um, in terms of temperature, yeah, I can I can I can tell you pretty confidently what we've seen um, because uh, I, I didn't mention this. We actually built a, a little SD card logger. Uh, so basically, you have your device, you know, your thermoelectric. It's on your wrist and um, just next to it is this, um, we bought it from a different bunch of maker companies, right? You know, a Coulomb counter, SD card reader, and it's just basically uh, measuring how much current you're producing and saving it to an SD card. And at the end of the day, you can just put in your computer and plot, you know, <laughs> the current that you've, pr you've produced. Um, when you go out on a cold day, um, you can generate a lot of power. Let's just to say, let's just uh, say that if, um, if it's hot, the power drops significantly. Um, the interesting thing is, well, let, let's talk offline. I, I, I guess I don't want to give a f give because it's being. Yeah, yeah, solar would be nice, but there's actually another thing you can do, and, and we should talk about offline. I'd, I'd rather not. Uh, so, does it run backwards if it's uh, hot enough? Out? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's where I was getting to, and, and the, the the short answer is yes. But I, again, I can share the details offline. So you yeah. need a, an inverter in there when it's running the long way. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, can you compare the current commercially available photoelectric material with uh, what you have? Have you, have you tried uh, putting that in, in the same watch and comparing the current at the same voltage? 
for versus for thermoelectric versus. Okay. Oh, I see. Like the incumbent material and um, yeah. No, great question. Um, um, why don't I answer that offline? Uh, <laughs> there, there's some. You know, I, I apologize. I don't want to be rude, but there's some proprietary. So I'm so happy to answer it offline. You don't yeah. Want it on camera. yeah, I don't want it on camera. Thank you. <laughs> back back to your sorry. Back to your question. I'll get to you. Um, it, it, you know, if you're in the Northeast on a winter day, it's this thing is is just great. You know, it, <laughs> it produces a lot of juice. Yeah. Uh, have people looked at like thermal rectifiers or phononic crystals to reduce the thermal conductivity? <coughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, that's still in the realm of research, but uh, there are there are thermal rectifiers um, out there. There are they're actually commercially available. Some thermal rectifiers that are um, commercially available. Um, that's more on the dissipation. The on the thermoelectric material side, which is I think what you're referring to, um, it's still in the in the realm of research. So people are doing phononic crystals at a few places, um, and the idea there, for maybe some of you who don't know, is you create a band gap uh, for the phonons. So just like in a semiconductor, there's band gaps for electrons where you know, they can't occupy energy levels, the same, same for phonons, and that reduces the thermal conductivity. That can reduce, potentially, the thermal conductivity tremendously, but it's still in the realm of um, research. Yeah? Your example watch thing, uh, the bracelet looks very heavy yeah. duty. Yeah. <laughs> I presume that, what, what, that might be because it's trying to gather as much heat area as possible. In effect, you're, there's a certain area where heat is flowing from your skin, through some channel right. to an outside radiator. How much of that is input and radiator? How much? What is the yeah. effective area that's being? The collector is actually just. I'll show it to you uh, when you know when at the, at the end here. Um, you can come up and see it. The, the collector is just underneath the the watch face, um, and then the rest of the band is the dissipation. Um, the uh, only reason this is really bulky and kind of crude looking is because. Um, you know, some of this is just was just machined uh, off the shelf, and we actually have a prototype that's coming out in a few months um, that we've contracted out to an industrial design firm that's going to look a lot nicer. What I'm wondering mm -hmm. is how many square inches of skin yeah. has to be in contact with the inside of that. Yeah, I, I think this is about. Um, I think this is about maybe three centimeters by three centimeters, roughly. Yeah, in this case, but. It's hard. To, it's hard to give you a definitive answer because I mean it really depends what you what you want to do and you know this is our Gen Zero device. Um, things are just going to get better over time. Where's the, where's the other end of the contact? I mean, is, is the so the the collection is through this face and then the heat dissipation is through the band. No fins. Don't you get cooling fins with that? Help? <laughs> Great question. Um, I'll, we can talk about it offline. <laughs> <coughs> The blood temperature. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting that your core obviously doesn't change, right? Because um, we're warm-blooded mammals, but your skin temperature can change um, significantly. I mean, there can, it can be wild vi variations. In fact, if you're outside on a cold day and you go inside a warm building, you know, the the, the warm air is going to be hotter than your skin temperature. Your skin's going to be really cold. I mean, there can be up to ten degree temp temp uh, uh, swings in temperature on on your skin. Even though your core body is is at thirty seven degrees Celsius, have you yep. looked at this for implants because they're uh, relatively close to the surface? Yes, yeah, it's great. Um, we have. Uh, well, I mean, we haven't looked at it closely, but um, you know, for example, pacemaker it runs off thirty microwatts of power, so very low power device. Yeah, until they fire. Until they what? Until they fire. Yeah. Well, no, no. no I, I'm ta I'm talking on average, so that that in, that it, that includes the the you know the duty cycling of the. Very low duty cycle, right? I mean, it's about a second, right? Um, I was thinking the, the internal defibrillators. Yeah. They only fire when you have a heart attack. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, so, for, so let's be clear. For both devices, you still want a battery, right. okay? Um, the, the problem is the battery has to be replaced every five to ten years. And there, that's a surgery, believe it or not. Now, you know, unfortunately, people that have these devices typically don't live five or ten years, but, you know, even then, right, there's still a majority, uh, there's still a lot that do, and you'd, you'd like to avoid having a surgery to replace the battery, right? So, 
Um, going back to your point on, you know, that the skin and if you position, so people have done studies in rabbits where you can actually, they've positioned a thermoelectric next to a, um, a warm blood uh, uh, artery, you know, uh, and, and your skin, right, is, is a little bit cooler, right? And it's actually, we like to joke that it's pr it would probably be even easier to do an implantable, um, you know, we're not for, for the not not the you know for the FDA regulations, of course, that you have to still pass. But uh, that temperature difference is going to be constant, right? <laughs> um, it's not going to fluctuate whether you go outside or inside. You know, on a cold day, hot day, whatever. Um, so yeah, the, the the short answer is absolutely that is it could be possible. Hearing aids are another thing that might be interesting, but. Even simpler, where you don't have to worry about uh, FDA regulations and even aesthetics, is like a medical armband that a lot of different companies are um, trying to get to the market that do pulse oximetry, EKG, lots of real estate. You know, you don't have to make it look nice, and the battery life there is is very low, is very short, and so the nurse has to change the battery every like 12 hours, which is a you know it's a big pain point. So there's there's a lot of applications potentially down the road in medical that we see. Yeah. Um, in a bracelet application, does it do you have problems with with the conductivity because it's sliding around? Is would you be better off gluing it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it would be it would be better. Yeah, spikes. <laughs> yeah, I mean there there definitely will be issues, right? If it's if it's loose and it's moving around, um, you know, it's got to be making co uh, contact to your skin in order to to maximize the amount of heat coming in. So, you know. You know, maybe in our first generation device, you know, maybe we'll have to, in the, in the instruction manual, you know, keep tight on your skin, right? Uh, <laughs> double sided sticky, double -sided sticky tape. tape. Yeah, I'm hairy, so that might, that might hurt, you know, when, when you take it off. But, <laughs> yeah. So you're focusing on wearables, but in theory, could this scale to sort of voyage your remote research? areas or outposts or even industrial power generation? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a company that just got acquired. Um, uh, it's a Canadian company. It, it, it did um, for uh, gensets, so for like uh, oil well, uh, um, natural gas pipeline monitoring. Um, these were like in the hinterlands of Canada where, you know, you don't want a guy going and changing, like, like you know, adding fuel to the thing, you know, I mean, or, or, or you know, changing a battery or whatever. Uh, so it would just basically just take some of the natural gas stream, burn it, and generate uh, power th through a thermoelectric that way, and it would just power the entire remote monitoring station. Uh, and those, those things last for, like, you know, uh, decades, right, as, as, long as, as long as you have that natural gas flow. And, and your monitor, I mean, I, I don't really know what they monitor, but I'm sure it's, it's a lot of different data, right, that they're getting. And... Um, so, so that type of, uh, you know, market exists. It's a very small market, right? It's very, very small. Um, drilling, right? Oil drilling, uh, yeah, that could be a potential, another potential one where, you know, you have this, this oil drill and it, it gets, there's a lot of sensors on it and, you know, it, there's issues with getting power down there. I mean, it, it's small markets though, so that's why. I don't know. Did you have something in mind that that might no, be? I, I was just curious yeah. since yeah. you mentioned the Voyager. Yeah. At the beginning. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Definitely. I think definitely doable. And in fact, people are doing it. Right. Yeah. Is there a reason you chose to nanostructure the silicon instead of just like put defects in bulk silicon? Yeah. Um, okay. Great question. And 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 um, I don't know how much I want to reveal, but um, you know, you can do it do both ways. And uh, you know, I'll leave it at that. But um, but the name of the game, if, right, if you look at, I don't know how familiar you are with, with the field, um, most people in thermoelectrics uh, take bulk silicon and they crush it into like a powder. They try to uh, ball mill it, for example, where you, you literally just throw bulk uh, semiconductors like bismuth telluride into a, a, a machine that basically has a bunch of ball bearings and it just rotates and it just, you know, the, the little ball bearings hit the semiconductor material and it kind of like break it up into nanoparticles and then they take that powder make it into a slurry and kind of compact it and heat it up and and now you've got this like bulk semiconductor that's got these little nanocrystalline grains that scatter phonons and lower thermal conductivity that way so so definitely i mean that that's a huge and in fact most researchers researchers in the field are doing things like that um, so so it's definitely an uh, definitely an interesting you know area 
So can you can you scav can you scavenge if, if we had defects these days in in normal, <laughs> in normal manufacturing of silicon? Can you use any silicon, or does it or or, yeah. do, or do you care? Yeah, no, I I I, I think uh, I think you could. We have not tried. Right now, we do everything single on single crystalline wafers, um, but uh, you could absolutely do. Um, I think. <coughs> I think so. Yep. I think it's possible. We just haven't tried it. Okay, they have scrap <laughs> Back when they had scrap. Right. Okay, cool. All right, thank you.